Thank you, Miss Marilyn. Appreciate that. Welcome our Facebook Live family again. This and friends this morning have joined us live on Facebook. We appreciate you checking in each week and all of our home folks here on campus this morning. We're glad that you are here as we are studying through the book of Ephesians. I'm going to ask you to take God's word, find Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to be looking in verses 1 through 4 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. Last week I preached on a ser sermon, Jesus is Lord. Paul moves from Jesus is Lord to we were lost in sins. So I want to talk about that today. Lost in sins, a sober reminder. In chapter 2, Paul begins to describe the condition of mankind without God. He gives the Christians in Ephesus a sober reminder about who they were. Uh, there are things that we need to, uh, to, to forget about in life. We need to forget some things in life so that we can move forward and be fruitful in the present. But there are also some things that we must never forget. And I'll, I'm here to remind you of some things this morning that, that we should never forget. We all have ki uh, ki all kinds of reminders built into our lives uh, to help us. I mean, we got alarm clocks to, uh, to uh, wake us up in the morning. We have notifications on our phones to remind us of an appointment that we need to make. Uh, we have a, a sticky notes we put on our refrigerator uh, to my, remind us of groceries we need to buy or uh, food that we need to set out or, or, or meals we're going to cook. Email reminders about a payment due, a test to be taken, a, a meeting to attend, an appointment to make. We have all kinds of reminders and some are more important than others. In the Christian life, we have reminders throughout the Word of God, uh, by the Spirit of God, and by the people of God, we get reminded. Some reminders impact us differently than others. Some reminders should have ongoing and far-reaching impact uh, in our living today. So in this passage we're going to look at today, Paul declared the deadness, the deception, the disobedience, the defilement, and the doom of the lost. Recognition of our lostness is key it is key in coming to salvation. And remembering our lostness is key in our continuing in sanctification as the people of God. So I want to call today, listen to me, I want to call the dead to come to life by trusting in the Lord Jesus. And I want to challenge the believers to remember their lost condition and rejoice in God's provision of salvation. Have you recognized your state without Christ? Are you separated from God today by your trespasses and sins? I've got good news today. Have you truly trusted Christ and his life, his forgiveness, and his mercy are yours? Have you recognized that you are lost in your sins? This passage is going to give us some reminders today about being lost in sins. So I want to ask you if you're physically able to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's holy and perfect word in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. You follow along now, for this is the word of our great God. The Bible says, And you... He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. You may be seated as you, we pray together this morning. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to deaf ears today, that you would speak to hardened hearts today. Lord, if there's any in this place today that are spiritually dead, Lord Jesus, may you speak to them, awaken them, redeem them, save the lost today. Lord, remind the saved that we were once lost in our sins. And God, may it be a source of encouragement for us to praise you, to honor you, to live for you, inspire us, Lord, to continue on for Jesus. I pray that you'd use this message in our lives today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in verses 1 through 3, I want to point out, Paul points out our, the, the former condition of the saints. If you're taking notes with me, the former condition of the saints. I heard about this a man and woman that were, uh, went to counseling. And, and as soon as they got there, the first question the counselor asked him, what are y'all here for? Why do you need counseling? The man, the husband said, well, my wife is, my wife is always historical. Uh, uh, the, the, the counselor said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, I mean historical because she is always bringing up my past. Listen to me today. Paul is about to get historical about man's sin. 
about our sinfulness. He speaks, first of all, and you see it up there on, your, uh, on the outline there, he speaks about their spiritual condition. Look what it says. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So it's good for us to remember our former condition in life. It will serve us well to remember that, uh, that spiritually we were lost, that we were dead. So Paul speaks to those who are saved now, the Christians, those whom God has made alive in Christ. Before we came to Christ, we, like these Ephesians, were dead in our trespasses and sins. Paul is definitely not speaking about their physical death. They were, he's writing to them they were physically alive. He's not talking about that. He's talking about their spiritual death. All those who have been born into the world have life. God's given you life. He's breathed the breath of life in your nostrils. You've been created in the image of God. Men and women, we've been created in his image. And he's breathed the breath of life into our mortal bodies. So Paul's not saying, I'm talking about physically dead, dead here. Though one day you and I are going to be physically dead. The Ephesians were spiritually dead. They had no life spiritually. They were separated from God because of their trespasses and sins. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the Bible says this, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. We're all guilty before God. We have all sinned and been taken in our trespasses and sins. We have sinned and we have all died. We've, we've been dead in our trespasses and sins. That word dead, necros, in the Greek, it means, uh, literally, it means a corpse. That's what it means. We were a corpse, a spiritual corpse. Now, the basic meaning of death is separation. Uh, death never means extinction. It never means annihilation. It never means non-existence or inactivity. Death simply means that a person is separated, either separated from his body or from God and his body, or both. Our former condition is clearly defined. We need to be reminded that we were once spiritually dead. We were dead. James Montgomery Boyce, I know this is a exciting message to you. That's okay. I'm going to preach it anyway. Amen. James Montgomery Boyce shared this commentary. Some years ago, I heard uh, John Gerstner compare th this to what horror stories call a zombie. He said, for the benefit of those who do not read such literature, a zombie is a person who has died, but who is nevertheless up walking around. To make matters even more gruesome, the body is not dead, but decaying, putrefying. It is the most disgusting thing many people can imagine. But that is what Paul says the human condition is before God. In their opposition to God, men and women are walking corpses. They are the living dead. Gershner says they are an, an offense to God's nostrils. These decaying spiritual corpses stink. If somebody today tells you you stink, has anybody ever told you you stink? You can tell them, that's okay, I used to stink, but Jesus has made me alive now. I've got the fragrance of the rose of Sharon on me because I've been raised from the dead. I used to stink. Now, I stink at some things. I, 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 when you try to do some things, I'm not good at so, certain things. I wish I was better at golf. I'm not, a good, I'm not very good at that. I'm better than some people, but, you know, I'm, I'm not the standard, amen. But Lehman Strauss said, man is separated from God because the life cord has been severed. We're spiritually dead. Some of you don't remember this. Uh, some of you are young ones. You can look it up. Google it later on. Don't Google it while I'm preaching. Uh, on July 5th, 1989, Hollywood released a box office smash called Weekend at Bernie's. The movie is about a fun-loving salesman, Richard and Larry, who are invited by their boss, Bernie, to stay the weekend at his beach house. Little do they know that Bernie is the per perpetrator of a fraud they've uncovered, and he is arranging to have them killed. When the plan backfires and Bernie is killed instead, the buddies decide not to let a little death spoil their fun weekend at the beach house. So they pretend that Bernie is alive, uh, leading to hijinks and corpse desecration galore. Four years later, 1993, Weekend at Bernie's 2 came out in the movie theater. Uh, four years later, the dead man was still traveling around and making his rounds. Let me tell you today, we all have been dead men and women walking around at one time. Our world is full of people living in a perpetual weekend at Bernie's. Paul says they were dead. I love what Warren Wiersbe said. Listen to this word. It's such a great word. Warren Wiersbe said, the unbeliever is not sick. He is dead. He does not need resuscitation. He needs resurrection. All lost sinners are dead. And the only difference between one sinner and another sinner is the state of decay. The lost derelict on Skid Row may be more decayed outwardly than the unsaved society leader, but both are dead in sin. 
and one corpse cannot be more dead than another. This means that our world is one vast graveyard filled with people who are dead while they live. That's the truth. Have you remembered your former condition? Uh, it will serve us well to remember our former condition when we were dead in sin. John R. Stott said lots of people who make no Christian profession whatever, who even openly repudiate Jesus Christ, appear to be very much alive. One has the vigorous body of an athlete, another the lively mind of a scholar, a third the vivacious personality of a film star. Are we to say that such people, in, if Christ has not saved them, are dead? Yes, indeed, we must do so. We must do say they, that very thing. For in the sphere which matters supremely, which is neither the body nor the mind nor the personality but the soul they have no life and you can tell it they are blind to the glory of Jesus Christ deaf to the voice of the Holy Spirit they have no love of God no sensitive awareness of his personal reality no leaping of their spirit towards him in the cry Abba Father no longing for fellowship with his people they are as unresponsive to him as a corpse so we should not hesitate to affirm that a life without God however physically fit and mentally alert the person may be is a living death and that those who live if uh, live it are dead even while they are living we've been dead in our trespasses and our sins the word trespass the Greek word means to fall a sin or a misdeed to cross the line to cross the line the word sins there means to miss the mark or, or to err we, you say, you've heard that old shooting at a target we miss the mark <laughs> we fall short we fall away we're not even shooting at the target I mean so, most of us shooting the other the opposite way the trespasses is a great word. Uh, it means to step over the line in defiance to the command and will of God. In our example, if you go to a property and on that property it says no trespassing, if you go into that property, you have crossed the line. And if you get shot over there or if you get arrested over there, you're not supposed to be there. Amen. So you're trespass. You broke the law. You're guilty. It's the same thing what happened in the Garden of Eden way back when Adam and Eve... And they tres Eve trespassed the commandment of God. God told Adam and Eve that they can eat of every tree in the garden as much as they want, but they are not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were free to eat except for that tree. Now, when Eve listened to the serpent, Satan, and she took of that tree, she trespassed. She crossed over the line. She gave some to Adam. Adam trespassed. They crossed over the line. They trespassed, and they died a spiritual death that day. Now, they didn't die physically that day, but they died you can search the world all over today. You will not find Adam and Eve. They've de they're physically dead. And they brought physical death into the world. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it's up here on the screen. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That word wages means we earn it. You go to work, you work a job, your employer pays you a wage. You earn that paycheck. We have all earned death because we have all sinned. But listen to the last part of that verse. Thank God for the but. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He said we are dead in our trespasses and sin. I love what John MacArthur, what a great word. Listen to this. He said in this context, trespasses and sins do not refer simply to acts, but first of all to the sphere of existence of the person apart from God. He does not become a liar when he tells a lie. He tells a lie because he's already a liar. He does not become a thief when he steals. He steals because he's already a thief. And so with murder, adultery, covetousness, and every other sin, committing sinful acts does not make us sinners. We commit sinful acts because we are sinners. That's a good word. Good explanation of why sinners sin. We've all been tainted. We've all been, we've been born into sin. Uh, so that's what we do, sinners sin. And, and that's what we, we've been corrupted, ruined by it trespasses and sin we've all been dead in our trespasses and sins may we recognize today our lost state and may we uh, as believers remember our former condition so he speaks about their spiritual condition in verse 1 secondly don't you notice their sinful course in verse 2 through 3 we're going to study about their sinful course in verse 2 Paul gives a testimony about their past walk look what it says in which you once walked according to the course of this world so Paul is now reminding the church of the testimony of their past walk, their sinful course. The you there, you see that in verse 2? You, in which you, that, that reminds us of the scope of the corruption. It's, it's all everywhere. Those Ephesians who read it and us who are reading it too, it, it encompasses everyone. You, 
The word once there reminds us of a past time, the way things used to be, the reality of our past life. You once. But thank God that word, all, that word once also reminds us as believers we have been saved and we have been changed. If you are living like you used to live and living how you've always lived, you've not met Jesus Christ. You've not been born again. When Jesus saves you, he changes you. And he's still working on us, hallelujah. But there's been a, a change. Because you once were dead, now you're alive. He said, you once walked. Peripateo is the Greek word. It means to tread all about, to walk about. And it speaks of the, uh, their manner of living. I've shared that word with you before, their walk, their way of life. It's a constant various tense in the Greek language which magnifies the fact that everything they did was sin. Everything they did was no, they did nothing out of pure motives and righteousness. Because we, we're in sin. We've been dead in sin. Those who are lost cannot please God. Their minds and their lives and their desires and their actions are carnal and corrupt. It speaks of the depravity of mankind. We've been depraved. Why is it? Listen, no husband or wife is free from selfishness all the time and sin all the time. No marriage is what it should be because two sinners are married together. Amen. No father or mother treats their child like they should all the time because mom and daddies are sinners. No child obeys their parents perfectly all the time. Why? Because they're sinners. No workman is diligent in his labor every minute of the day. Sometimes we cheat the clock. Sometimes we don't work as we should. Why? Because we're sinners. No neighbor is as good and kind and helpful as he should be all the time. Not perfectly. No person disciplines his body in eating, exercising, and sleeping all the time. No person controls their minds from impure and selfish thoughts all the time because of sin. We once walked and lived. We were consumed. We conducted ourselves according to the course of this world. That word course there in the Greek, it means an age of time or a period of, of time during which certain things happen or a certain spirit or attitude is prevalent and permeates those times. So you, it, it means we lived in the world and we were of the world. We, we thought like the world. We thought like the lost world. We lived like the lost world. We acted like the lost world because we were of the lost world. The word world there, Paul uses is cosmos. He's not talking about the physical world, the ground, the dirt outside. He's uh, referring to the world system and the manner of the way things are done, the world's values. And by the way, if you are still walking uh, to the course of this world, you need a spiritual checkup. You need to check your spiritual heart rate. You need to check your spiritual blood pressure. You need to check see if there's any spiritual brain activity because you may very well still be dead in your trespasses and sins. The Bible tells us of the testimony of their past walk. Then verse 2, notice the truth about the prince of the world. Paul's going to move to the, about the truth about the prince of this world. He tells us what he resides over here. He said, according to the prince of the power of the air. So Paul reminds the church about the culprit behind the death and demise of this world. Those who are walking according to the course of this world do so according to the prince of the power of the air. They are influenced by the devil. That word prince there means arcan, means a first in rank and power, a chief, a magistrate, a ruler. This is a reference to Satan, to, de to the devil, to Lucifer, to the fallen angel. He's the prince of the power of the air. Matter of fact, the Bible describes Satan. Jesus said in John 12, 31, that he is the prince of this world. In Matthew 9, 34, he's called the prince of demons. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he is known as the God of this age. The little g, he's the God of this age. The prince of the power of the air describes his dominion in the atmosphere and over the world's systems. He's ruling up in the heavenlies where we see up in the atmosphere, but also the world system where we live at. He's in, in control. John Philip said the Bible clearly sees, says that there are spirits in the unseen world of the air. These spirits are fallen, malignant, and bitterly hostile to man, and they are ruled by the dread prince of the power of the air. This dark lord who roams the heavenlies is Satan. He's the one who brings evil influences to bear upon the world of men. Our state of spiritual death was demonstrated by the fact that we walked according to the spirit of the power of the air. So Satan had such complete control over us that his influence was all-encompassing as the air. 
Listen to this. He said the air is all about us. It exerts constant but unnoticed pressure on us. It can at, at times be felt, but in its essence, it is invisible and intangible. Such is Satan and his influence on the human race. He's the prince of the power of the air. The Bible tells us that. He right, resides over these things. He's the prince. He has infiltrated the world. He tempts people to do evil. He oversees an ongoing onslaught of this world by his demonic army. We are not to minimize or brush aside the truth about the devil. He is a real being. He's a powerful angel being. He is a fallen angel. He has a worldwide influence. He's a worldwide influence, influential spirit. The Bible tells us what he resides over. The Bible also tells us who he rules in. Notice in verse t uh, 2 again, he's the spirit uh, who now works in the sons of disobedience. Uh, so Paul gives a designation of the laws. Who's he at work in? He's, in the, he's at work in the, sp uh, uh, in the sons of disobedience, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So Paul reminds the believers uh, of the devil's rule in, in the world, in his work, in the lost. He designates us. We were there one time, like the lost people, as sons of disobedience. The spirit of the evil age continues to work in and through people. Look in your Bible there. See what it says in verse 2? According to the Prince of Power Air, the spirit who now, who now works. That means the devil and the demon's influence manipulate, sway, and lead people in disobedience to God. He's now at work. He was working 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote this letter. He's still at work today. He's now at work. Max Anders said this. I put this on the screen. He said, Satan's kingdom encourages us to have ungodly values, attitudes, and actions. Much the same way a spirit of enthusiasm at a ball game might encourage us to embrace the attitudes and actions of a sports fan. Sometimes we need some of that enthusiasm in the church. Amen. <laughs> Listen to this. We cheer, yell, jump up and down, and otherwise act in ways that we would not if we were not under the influence of the spirit of enthusiasm. Under the spirit of Satan's kingdom, we act in disobedient ways we would not normally follow. We've been influenced by the spirit of the age, the evil spirit of Satan and the spirit of the world at work. Listen, church, look around us. Open up your spiritual eyes and see. Listen in with your spiritual ears and hear. You'll be overwhelmed at the evil in the world. By the way, people are not basically good. We don't, well, Joe has a good heart. No, he don't. If he's lost, he's lost. The heart's decept, deceitful and wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9 said, the Lord said that. Joe don't have a good heart. He's lost. He's dead in his trespass sin. He needs to be saved. <laughs> people defy God's word, deny God's son, slander God's people, reject God's spirit, and they refuse God's grace because they're sons of disobedience. King James translates this word children. It's a good word. Children of disobedience. They are lost. Indeed, they are children of disobedience. By the way, parents, can I get an amen? It don't take you long. It didn't take you long to realize that your children are, are children of disobedience. You don't have to teach a children, child to lie, cheat, and steal. You don't have to teach your children to be mean, selfish, and vindictive. You don't have to teach them that. On the contrary, we have to teach a child how to tell the truth, be kind, share, be respectful, be helpful, because that don't come naturally to them. Oh, so you don't know my child. I mean, get over yourself. Your child is just like my children. Why? Because they've inherited a fallen nature. John MacArthur said, not all unsaved people are necessarily indwelt at all times by Satan or or are demon-possessed. But knowingly or unknowingly, they are subject to Satan's influence because they share his nature of sinfulness and exist in the same sphere of rebellion against God. They respond naturally to his leading and to the influence of his demons. They are on the same spiritual wavelength. Therefore, we are at one time just like they. We were lost. We were sons of disobedience. That word means disbelief, unbelief. It means rebellion, being rebellious, obstinate. We were all sons of disbelief, unbelief, rebellion, and we were obstinate against God and his word. This was our designation to the current and, and, and world. They're, they're de designated as a lost world of unbelievers. They're dead in their trespasses and sin. Secondly, verse 3, don't you, let's move to verse 3, talk about the description of their lives. And I've got three points you can put in your outline here. First of all, I want you to notice Paul gives a description of their lives. Notice the conduct of the peoples, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. So Paul includes himself there, Jews and Gentiles. They've all been rebels against God. 
They've all been a part of the Rebel Alliance. We were all where they are now. We all once conducted ourselves in the spirit of this age, and all were sons and daughters of disobedience. We all been rebels against God, sinners by birth and choice, and separated from God. We all. I've told you that Greek word all means all. Amen. Every one of us. This description of who we used to be should serve, though, to inspire us to live for Jesus and praise his holy name, to glorify him and honor Jesus in every way. Our conduct was contrary to God's word and God's will. May the church have compassion on the lost because we've been there and done that. Amen. We can empathize with those dead in their trespasses and sins because we've been dead in our trespasses and sins. We know what it's like to be dead, and we know what it's like to be uh, given life from the dead, and we know what they need to be saved is Jesus. The Bible tells us of the conduct of the peoples. Number two, Paul describes the corrupt, their corrupt practice. Look at what it says in the second part of verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the fle our, our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So Paul includes himself and everybody else in this. We all have conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. That word lust there uh, means uh, longing, especially what is forbidden. Uh, desire, or lust after. Now it doesn't just mean sex. It doesn't just have sexual overtones here. That's included in it, but it's not limited to that. So listen, anybody, anybody that's lusting for power, position, possessions, property, people, and plans are all that are in included in the lust of the flesh. Anything that we set our hearts on to go after, the desires of the flesh apart from the will of God and the word of God is lust. Those who are lost are corrupted by their desires and the flesh and their mind. The word mind there means deep thought, means their disposition, uh, their understanding. This word refers to deliberate choices that defy the word and will of God. So the unregenerate and the unrenewed mind is selfish and sinful. I know I've had one. The lost think of themselves, their plans, their schemes, their desire. The world revolves around them. Their minds are carnal and corrupt. In the days before God sent the worldwide flood on the earth, he told Noah to build an ark. And Noah and his sons and their, his wife and his sons and their wives got on the ark with the animals, and God shut him in. Listen to the testimony about the thoughts of man in Genesis 6, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says this, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wow. And the Lord was sorry that he made, had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. See, man, did we grieve God's heart? Yes, we've grieved God's heart. Those who are lost in their sin and rebellion against God uh, have grieved God's heart. We all at one time or another have conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, seeking to fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The word flesh there is not describing this meat on your skeleton. He's not talking about that. We are born in sin. We are inherited a sinful nature from our parents. Now, we don't want to be hard on our parents because they got it from our grandparents. <laughs> but you know what? Our children got it from us. That's the fact. We have passed a sinful nature on to our children. By the way, the dog acts like a dog because the dog is a dog. They have a dog's nature. You can't make a dog speak English. You can't make a dog walk on uh, normally on two legs or whatever humans do. They, they got a dog nature. Listen, sinners sin because they are sinners. This is a sad truth for those who do not know Jesus, and it was also true of all those who do know Jesus. We were dead. We were depraved. We were defiled. And by the way, the unconverted man lives to fulfill the desires of his flesh and his mind. In reality, that's all else he has to live for. And he knows nothing but, the, but this world and, it, and its appeals and its appetites. He seeks as much of this world as he can possess and enjoy. His life is self-centered and not God-centered. World-centered, not heaven-centered. Selfish, not giving. Banking and hoarding and not sacrificial. The unconverted man spends his life with the disobedient of this world, living with the desires of the flesh and the mind. Paul describes the conduct of the peoples. Secondly, he describes their corrupt practice. See in your outline, don't you notice their condemned position? And it's our condemned position as well. He says, and we're by nature children of wrath just as the others. And we're by nature children of wrath. So Paul reminds the church of the result of their rebellion and sin. 
We, we were like them. We were dead, depraved, defiled, disobedient, and then we were doomed. We were under the wrath of God by nature. Children of wrath. It reminds us of our position separated from God. And by the way, people are not good by nature. I've, I've touched on that here in this sermon. I'm going to say it again. We're not good by nature. When we were lost, we did what came naturally to us. And what we did reflected who we are, were, who we were. We were dead and we were lost and we were defiant to God and we were doomed. We were under the wrath, the orge. is the Greek word orge. It means the, the uh, indignation, the anger, the punishment of God. This word doesn't refer to a momentary burst of anger, but a settled and righteous judgment. The wrath of God is so much different than the wrath of man. Our anger flares up and our judgment is often hasty and unwarranted and, un and unjustified. But listen, God's wrath is warranted, justified, and just. Those who are without Jesus are children of wrath, just as the others. Those who are lost are under the wrath of God. They are sentenced to eternal separation from God in hell, and their only hope of being rescued and being redeemed is in and by and through Jesus. Stuart Allyot said, describes these lost people living in, under the wrath of God. He said this, I put it on the screen, living under his wrath is such a marked characteristic of their lives that they are described here as children of wrath. It is the distinct, distinctive feature of their lives. They live the whole of their life with God's anger hanging over them. They wake in the morning, pass through the day, and go to sleep at night with God's wrath over them. Because of their sin, he is never for them and always against them. He goes on to say how we should tremble as we think about this. For how many years were we disobedient, unresponsive, and hell-bound? At any moment, God could have stopped our breath and sent us screaming into conscious and everlasting punishment. But he didn't. It was... A, it was what we deserved. We daringly provoked him as our rebellion and unbelief increased by the minute. He did us good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our, filling our hearts with food and gladness. But we did not lift our hearts to him. How kind he was, how rich in mercy. There was no wrong in his anger. All the fault was ours. I was damned. You were damned. End of quote. We have all been under the wrath of God. If you haven't realized that, you're still there because you haven't come to Jesus. Because when you realize you're under the wrath of God, you want to flee from the wrath to come. And the only way you can flee is through Jesus and to Jesus. Have you trusted him today? If you've trusted him today, you've received him, and he received the wrath of God in your place. Amen. Praise the God. Thank God for Jesus. Paul gives a sober reminder of the former condition of the saints. Then I want to touch on just verse 4, and we'll be through in just a few minutes. On a, on a point number 2, I want you to notice the Father's compassion on the saints. We move from the former condition of the saints to the Father's compassion for the saints. In your outline, we're going to look at A today, just A. I've got two sub-points under that, so just listen quick, and I'll preach hard. Listen hard, and I'll preach quick. Amen. Notice the passion of God for the church. Paul changes gear, and he talks about the passion of God for the church. Two things about this passion of God. We see it there in your outline, the richness of his mercy. But God, verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy. Boy, that but makes me want to shout. That but is a wonderful and glorious conjunction in this sentence. It transitions from the bad news to the good news, from our guilt to God, from our former condition lost to the Father's compassion and us being saved. This is not just any, uh, any conjunction, but it ties God to the contrast here. Paul had point pointed man's condition, dead, depraved, disobedient, doomed. Paul then magnifies God's compassion. He is rich in mercy. That word rich, by the way, mean, it carries the idea of abounding with. Abounding with. He's abounding in mercy. His mercy over, is overflowing and overwhelming. His mercy is uh, uh, abundant and abounding. David Jeremiah said, this is a good word. He said, God is rich in mercy, which is exactly what sinners need. Amen? He said, because God is rich in mercy, there is no sin so deep that God's mercy can't cover it. He has more mercy than we have guilt and shame. That ought to make a Baptist want to shout amen. And I'm a Baptist, so I'm just going to shout, amen, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Romans chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Listen to this verse Paul says. For as... 
that's kind of little, so I'll read it to you. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where sin abounded, grace much more did abound. Amen. Thank God he's rich in mercy. Mercy, by simple definition, in, in biblical terms, is God withholding his judgment and extending grace. By the way, justice, mercy, and grace, those all terms are synonymous. Don't ever ask God, I, God, I just want justice. I want what's coming to me. No, you don't. You don't need justice. You need mercy. Now, justice is getting what we do deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. God not giving me what I deserve. He's had mercy on me. God goes a step further than that. He has to have mercy on us so he can give us grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. That's icing on the cake. God is rich in mercy and thank God for his mercy. The believers in Ephesus were reminded of who they were before they were saved and they were reminded of why they were saved. Because God is rich in mercy. It is helpful, church for us to be reminded of our former condition so that we can rejoice in our present position. God is rich in mercy. What a contrast from what we were and what we deserve to what, who God is and what he has for us. So second, last point, we've talked about the richness of his mercy. Paul revealed, gives a revelation of his motives. Why did God do this? Why was God rich in mercy? Why did God have mercy on us? Verse 4 says, who is rich in mercy, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. God is rich in mercy and it is displayed, his mercy is displayed in his love for us, his great love. And listen, today God loves you. If you're lost today, you're undone, you're under the wrath of God, I'm here to tell you today, God loves you. God loves all of us. God loves us. God loved us so much while we were dead, while we were defiant, while we were disobedient, while we were doomed. God sent his son to die for our sins. Jesus died our death, took our punishment, suffered our shame, bore our sins, paid our penalty. He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. Romans 5, 8 says this. Listen as I put on the screen. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah, church. The love of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. Paul Garner said this, and I'm closing just real quick. He said, never in Scripture is God portrayed as one who compromises one side of his character for the sake of another. His justice is not compromised for the sake of his extraordinary love. It is part of God's character that he is also prepared to be merciful. His mercy is, of course, shown in Christ. As Christ voluntarily dies on the cross for his people, he does so under the wrath of judgment of God. Think about the love of God for us. The love of God should inspire us, make us humble and grateful and thankful and faithful servants of the Most High God. Let's rejoice in his mercy and his great love that God has for us. And all of this is made possible because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Hey, listen, it was at Calvary that God demonstrated his hatred for sin. And it was at Calvary that God demonstrated his love for sinners. Rejoice in the Lord today, Christian. Rejoice, repent, and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ today, lost sinner. If you're here today, you're lost. Believe the good news. Awaken up. Wake up. Jesus died for you. He conquered the grave. He got up on the third day, and he lives to be Lord of your life. Awaken and be saved from the wrath to come. Come to Jesus, who is rich in mercy and great in love for you and for me. Trust in Jesus and be saved today. Respond in faith today and trust Jesus. Rejoice in Jesus and be resolved to live for Jesus because we once were lost in our sins. George Whitefield was a preacher from England that moved to America. He lived from 1714 to 1770. George Whitefield was instrumentally used by God in the first great awakening of America. He preached and many people were saved under his ministry. You ever heard the name George Whitefield? He described this being dead in trespasses and sins like Lazarus who was dead, physically dead. In his sermon about this, listen to what he said and I'm closing. 
He said, come, ye dead, Christless, come, converted sinners. Come and see the place where they laid the body of the deceased Lazarus. Behold him laid out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, locked up and stinking in a dark cave with a gravestone placed on the top of it. View him again and again. Go near to him. Be not afraid. Smell him. Oh, how he stinketh. Was he bound hand and foot with grave clothes? So art thou bound hand with foot with thy corruptions. And as a stone was laid on the sepulcher, so is there a stone of unbelief upon thy stupid heart. Perhaps thou hast lain in this state not only four days, but many years, stinking in God's nostrils. And what is still more affecting, thou art as unable to raise thyself out of his loathsome dead state to a life of righteousness and true holiness as ever Lazarus was to raise himself from the cave in which he lay so long. Thou mayest try the power of thine own boasted free will and the force of energy of moral persuasion and rational arguments which, without all doubt, have their proper place in religion. But all thy efforts exerted with never so much vigor with, will, will prove fruitless and abortive till that same Jesus who said, Take away the stone and cried, Lazarus, come forth. Also quicken you. End of quote. Would you listen dead person listen to the voice of Jesus listen for his voice awaken he loves you he died for you he don't want to see you go to hell he came to this earth to take your punishment on, on the cross he bore the wrath of God for us he took my sin and my shame he took your sin and your shame be saved today Christian rejoice in God's mercy and love and salvation trust him and love him with all of your heart why there's a reminder. I, I just believe God has let me remind you today of our former condition so that we can rejoice in our present position. If you're saved today, we ought to be the most thankful and grateful and humble people of God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Lost in sins. Be saved today. If you're lost in sins, call upon him today and be saved. If you're saved today, rejoice in him and let's honor him. Father, thank you for your word today. And God, I pray that your word will not return unto you void. But Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd speak to Lazarus today. Those who are like Lazarus, dead in their trespasses and sins, Lord, would you remove away the sepulcher, that, that, that stone on their heart, and speak to them. Come forth, dead man, dead woman, de bo dead boy, do dead girl. Come forth today and save the lost here, Lord. God, I pray that you remind your people today of our lost estate without you. Remind us of how we were lost, how we were dead, how we were doomed. Now, we were under the wrath of God. Lord, I pray your people would be grateful, thankful people of God, that we'd be rejoicing that you delivered us from our deadness. Thank you for life, Lord. Thank you for eternal life. We give you praise today, Lord. We worship you during this invitation time, Lord. I pray we'd respond in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? I am resolved no longer to linger.